Destiny 2 Expansion 2 Warmind DLC has been out now for about three weeks at the time of this upload. I have completed every mission, every strike, beat the new raid, Escalation Protocol, and have completed most of the steps of the time-gated pursuits. All hidden collectibles have been found, exotics collected, and these are my thoughts on Destiny 2 Warmind. What's going on Guardians? Sly here back at it once again with another Destiny 2 video for you. And today we're going to be diving into my official review of the Warmind DLC. Now a ton of other YouTubers dropped a review like the first week it was out, before hitting level cap, before beating the raid, before trying out all the new weapons and everything else. But in order to do any game justice, you need to flesh out everything it has to offer. While a few secrets I believe are still out there lurking, waiting to be found, most of the DLC has been played. So without further ado, let's dive in into my thoughts for D2 Warmind. Guardians, Bungie is, is a, it's a funny company. I mean, I love them to death and they are capable of amazing things that explore far corners of our solar systems and at times can blow your mind with their amazing world art, captivating music, and challenging activities. But for the past year, things have been extremely odd. When Destiny 1 was late into its first iteration, those were by far the best times this game has seen. The Taken King and Rise of Iron were amazing, delivering a lengthy endgame with great raids and a decent campaign to quell our thirst for lore and story continuation. However, enter Destiny 2. While I agree that a newer updated graphics engine along with streamlined dev tools was needed and Destiny has never looked as good as it does today, especially on PC, the trade-off to get to those things seemed to come at a steep price. Ever since D2 launched, it was either 1, you get a decent storyline with a minuscule endgame, or 2, you get zero story with a decent endgame. Warmind fits this description like a freaking glove. The base game of D2 had a pretty awesome campaign. I, mean, I thought it was pretty fun. The best campaign probably Destiny has seen yet. However, once that ended, the end game just died off, like extremely so. DLC 1 Curse of Osiris had a small but fairly decent campaign, and then that was like pretty much it. The raid layer was there, but the end game consisted of grinding the same missions which you play during the campaign over and over and over again to farm these, you know, consumables to, to find new weapons, which were only like a handful of those were ever decent enough to be worth it. So, enter Warmind. A super small campaign, disappointingly so, but also enter a decent endgame. Why is it that we cannot get a miniaturized version of the Taken King? I mean, a good, decent sized storyline with a decent sized endgame. So far, it's always one or the other. This is the first real dive into the Bray family and all of its secrets surrounding it. I mean, I spent hundreds of hours scouting around Mars, seeing Bray all over the place, reading into the lore of the Exos, wondering what could be just below my feet if I swept away all of the sand. While the Rasputin concept is cool and the ending was awesomely creepy, it felt like you were rushed to get there and you experienced the climax and the ending seconds after each other. Now there is so much more we could have experienced, so much more story could have been told. I mean, it feels like a huge wasted opportunity and that is what saddens me the most. The potential here was absolutely massive. Now don't take this criticism the wrong way. I'm in no way saying the DLC is terrible. But I just hate going through something and constantly thinking that they could have done this here or that there. Again, lots of space to blow Guardians out of the water with a bunch of wows, but a wasted opportunity. Unfortunately, the campaign was underserved. Now, spoiler alert for those who haven't played or watched the campaign yet. This is your chance to leave. One, two, three, and... Okay, alright, so we end up fighting the baddest of like all Hive bosses to date, right? A Worm God. An actual Worm God. We read about him, we hear about him, we, we hear whispers of them. One of the worm gods, right? Mightier even than Oryx. Instead of a cutscene showing the world this worm has devoured or a flashback of how the worm god was created or how this hierarchy came to be, perhaps even how Zul ties in with Oryx, we get some scary rumblings and a two minute boss fight that is an absolute cakewalk. Nocris seemed to be more of a badass than Zul, which I think isn't what Bungie or the lore was shooting for. But the campaign rushes into it. We don't dive into the Bray history all that much, and we don't get a lot of questions answered about the Exos, and then there's the quote-unquote new enemy, which is simply Hive with ice on them. So all in all, while the campaign was super fast, it was kind of fun, and a casual dive into the new world, it fell short. It was too easy, too broad, and again, way too short. Curse of Osiris had a longer campaign, if that tells you anything. However, let's move away from that and start focusing on what this game did right. 
Once you get out of the campaign, that is where war mine starts to brighten up. But first, let's get something out of the way here. There is a mountain, like an Everest-sized mountain, of reskin and reused items here. The new enemies, you know, quotation marks, the armor, weapons, most of it seem to be reskinned weapons and stuff from the past, which has always been an issue with Bungie in order to save on time, but there is a lot of it here. However, put that aside, and there are tons of things to like about the Warmind Endgame. First things first, leveling. I absolutely love the new design of the leveling system. Making it so players can't go to max power in just a few hours was a great first step. I think they absolutely nailed the perfect amount of time that it's supposed to take. For the hardcore players out there, you can make it to you know max power in around you know two and a half, three weeks, give or take, depending on a number of things. If you had any raid keys saved up in the Postmaster, or if you had any leftover Osiris weapons to forge, which by the way dropped just like powerful engrams, you could have made it to 385 pretty fast, especially if you did all the raids and trials and all of your milestones. But most are coming into the middle or late 370s right around now, which is about three weeks, and the more casual players are probably hitting the late 360s right around now. And like I said, we're about three weeks in from the time this video is created. This time frame makes it so that everything fits together very, very nicely. So while I thought I wouldn't like how stingy they became with drops after 370 power level, but in fact, I really couldn't even tell, and I think it is an absolute great addition. Slowing players down makes them come back and then level up, which gives everyone more things to do. Even though we all think we want to hit max power as soon as possible, most of the time you just end up shooting yourself in the foot by rushing through content as fast as possible so you can hit max level. But with the way Warmind was set up and how they kind of thought ahead to the future and how rewards drop, it not only extends content, it makes you revisit all the activities Destiny has to offer, which is something this game was lacking. Reasons to go through everything new or old. The new exotic tunings were awesome, guys. Everything they touched worked out very, very well. And while I do foresee some nerfs in the future, it was, for the most part, a huge success. They feel powerful and are much, much more fun to use. Crimson rewards precision with never-ending bullets. Darcy feels so good to use, especially once you get your masterworks upgraded. Sunshot is now even better and more satisfying when things explode. And Graviton is the postcard of what a good exotic should be. A little annoying in Crucible right now, but nonetheless really fun. Sleeper Simulant isn't quite the beast it used to be, but it's still pretty damn strong and still fun to use. The only letdown exotic-wise, in my opinion so far, is the exotic sword. It does need a little bit of help. Add all of the changes from the Go Fast update to everything Warmind brought, and we have a huge step in the absolute right direction. Now, more tweaking will be required before it's all said and done, but take all of these successes with the upcoming exotic armor pass through, and I think things will get even better. Now, one thing Bungie needs to take a look at again are supers. Golden Gun, Nova Bomb, Stormcaller, all of these, I think, need a buff in terms of PvE damage. I mean, when it takes three shots of a Golden Gun to kill a Yellow Bar Minotaur, then something is definitely wrong. Stormcaller has terrible damage output against Yellow Bar enemies, while a Titan, Hammers or Striker, can take out like Ogre after Ogre. A Warlock and Stormcaller can't even take out one <laughs> Ogre with Stormcaller or even a Nova Bomb. With a one-time use super, it needs a little bit of help, and Stormcaller needs major and ultra damage increases. Sentinel also needs a little bit of uh, reworking, but that is all for another discussion. Next up, let's talk about the raid. Now, Spire of Stars, I believe, is exactly what a good raid layer is supposed to look like. It's not a full-fledged raid, remember that, but it's not like a one-fight wonder either. From start to finish, Spire of Stars is a pretty fun encounter. The jumping puzzle is fun, the mechanics with the ball as of right now I think are fun, although I do foresee it becoming annoying here in a few months, and the starting fight is definitely a good check to see if you can make it going forward. With the constant stream of ads and taking guardians out by making them hold a ball, it creates situations where you have to communicate and have to coordinate. Now once you get how all of it works, it becomes an easy encounter, but when the raid first dropped and everyone was like in their mid 350s, maybe low 360s, it caused a few tense moments, which are always memorable, especially since everyone was still new to the encounter. After the first area, you drop down into an awesome jumping puzzle and a really fun game of passing the ball in order to unlock one of the chests. Now this one drops raid loot, so it makes the effort absolutely worth it, especially if you're still leveling. Small things like that, you know, they go a very long way in making a good raid. Even just one little extra chest or one little hidden area, that could just make or break a raid right there. Now the final area, the observatory, is a pretty cool fight as well. Seeing the ships get blasted out of space while you're on your plate is an awesome little touch. 
The final encounter takes place in the same room, just like the infight of the first raid layer Eater of Worlds. Now this might be the most mechanic heavy boss fight that Destiny has to date. Now, don't get this twisted guys, these mechanics are not hard, but there are lots of them. All the steps of assigning plates for the doors, assigning home plates, when to get off, when to get on, who goes where, who gets the ball, who goes up to see the ship, who calls it out, and then there's the superior retainer status effect or empowerment as I like to call it. You have to worry about that, and then the death mechanic where you have to pass the ball to every member of your team or it kills you, it has a pretty steep learning curve at the start. But once you learn it, it does become really easy. Once again, it's simple repetition. You do it enough times, it's kind of like a dance. You're going to start to get every single step and you'll get it down no problem. Like I said, this boss fight has the most mechanics and steps of any raid out there, but they're not hard steps to do, just lots of them. So if you add all the steps to that encounter, that is, by the way, at max power of 380, and it created a challenging raid for those who went in on day one, which is exactly what I think all of us wanted. A fun, challenging team activity that when you finally learn all of the steps and, and you're at level, still creates a little challenge, but nothing you have to go absolute try hard on. Which is why I think Ray Layer Eater of Worlds is so popular because it's short, semi-challenging, but easy once you get the hang of it. It doesn't take a long time to complete, but you can still get a decent amount of raid gear, and a lot of gamers out there like a challenging activity that doesn't take a long time to complete, yet you can still get cool gear from it. So I think that's why raid layers are becoming so popular. They're fast, you get decent gear, and you get to say that you've done a raid for the day. So while I would of course still prefer a full-blown raid every DLC, if Bungie continues the raid layer path, which I think it will, then as long as it keeps the length to around what Spires of Stars is, then it's not going to hurt all that bad. Three full-blown encounters, five chests in total, that is a decent raid layer. Now I used to always say that if Eater of Worlds had just one more encounter within that it would be a much better experience, and I think Spire of Stars shows just that. Now as far as the boss fight itself, it is pretty generic, it's just some rando cabal guy who needs to get the boot, so we do just that. It would be nice to somehow keep raids tied into the story, like with Oryx and the Taken King. Anyways, finally let's take a look at Escalation Protocol, touted as the hardest open world activity Bungie has ever created. They definitely meant every word of that. For those who watched my guide I created the first couple days Warmind was out, you can see the power of stacking buffs and debuffs along with a little teamwork. Escalation Protocol is a fun open world activity, but I think it's kind of really, really odd. Like, the only reason it's become easy is due to the fact that most teams are going in with nine guardians. And because of the recent booper buff, Tractor Cannon, along with the recent rediscovered melting point, that's the only reason teams are just melting these bosses so quickly. Whether or not this was intentional, I can't really say. Now I also don't know how many players this game mode was designed for because there's no way a patrol group of three guardians could take on that many bosses, that many ultras with that much health and expect to win. Maybe if you're like, you know, one of the top 10 players out there and you're at max level, but otherwise it's all up to tractor cannon, void weapons, and nova bombs. If it wasn't for that, these encounters would be mind-numbingly tough. The last two levels in Escalation Protocol, 6 and 7, are power level 400, so 20 above the max, 15 if you count modern equipment, but that is still a pretty big gap, especially considering the type of enemies you encounter here. It's not just a few red bars and one major roaming around like on a nightfall, these are all ultras and majors everywhere you look. So while I'm not really sure how this encounter was designed to be played or what the purpose of it really is, it's fun, plain and simple. Going in there and absolutely just melting raid-like bosses in a few seconds feels pretty damn good. When you find a team that just syncs together well, there's, you know, with tethers constantly going off, heavy and orbs are everywhere, bosses always have some kind of status effect applied, it just feels good to be a part of, you know? You get melted quite a bit towards the end, but when it really counts, everyone focuses on what has to happen to get things done, and this definitely fulfills the power fantasy players have been asking for. The armor looks pretty good, and again, it's kind of similar to the armor from Rise of Iron, but the weapons are what makes this encounter worth the effort. Hard to get, rare drops from what is supposed to be, and if Tractor Cannon gets nerfed, will be a tough encounter. This is something Destiny desperately needed. Grinding and farming, you know, those are two completely different things. The Curse of Osiris weapons needed a certain amount of consumables. In order to forge those weapons, you had to farm for tons of them. That was annoying. This, however, is a grind that will always be changing. The people will be changing, bosses, tactics, locations. Even though you might be fighting the same boss, the people you're with 
will change the experience tremendously. This type of grind is something Destiny has been missing for quite some time, so it is a nice addition to see. Now, I do agree that Escalation Protocol isn't everyone's cup of tea, and admittedly, I kind of have to be in the mood to deal with 9 people while trying to secure a lobby, but when the raid starts to fade and there's nothing left to level, Escalation Protocol and its weapons will be there, so that is going to be a definite plus. The pursuits so far are also a nice addition. A little weekly surprise gets you moving around Mars again, and while it is time-gated, I think the next few secrets will also come in the same form. One day, I think something's just going to show up in your inventory, and it will start another quest for another exotic weapon. So those are definitely a welcomed addition, and it's nice to have an additional layer within the end game, something else to focus on when everything else is done. All in all, guys, Warmind hasn't really wowed me, but it is way better than Curse of Osiris. The real jewel of this DLC is its end game, something that was completely absent in DLC 1. So while the campaign missed out on a lot of things, once you get past that, you start to get sucked back into the Destiny grind, and it's something that I have been missing. How long would this last? No, who really knows. But overall, if I had to give it a rating, I'd probably give it 3.5 out of 5. Maybe 3 and 3 quarters. The campaign, the weak, quote unquote, new enemy, the reused everything are what brings this DLC down below 4 stars. If the campaign were a bit longer, a bit more involved, a little harder, then I could see rising it close to 4 out of 5 stars. But until Bungie sorts out it's one or the other thing it has going on concerning campaigns and endgame, then the score will always teeter around those same numbers. But that is about it, Guardians. What are your thoughts on the Bungie's latest? Are you enjoying it? Do you hate it? Love it? Let me know in the comments down below. I always find it interesting to see how y'all's views align with mine. So definitely let me know. One thing I am excited for is that not only will we start learning about the Big Fall expansion coming soon here at E3, but Prestige Mode Raid Lairs will be dropping in a month or two, along with the next exotic armor update, so that will fill the content void during the summer and keep everyone sated until the next release, which I hope Bungie knocks out of the park. But anyways, Guardians, I am out of here. As always, thank you all so much for watching and for supporting the channel. Feel free to check me out on Twitter or Facebook, Sly Nation, Sly Nation Gaming. Cannot wait to see what awaits us at E3 and for the next round of updates. Let me know your thoughts about it and be sure to keep it here for everything D2, Anthem, and Division 2, including new videos coming out here soon. But until then, this is your dude Sly, and I'll catch you all next time. Two.